As we have mentioned, uh, I'm an attorney here in Savannah. I focus my work on intellectual property and, and technology matters mostly. Um, from Savannah originally, I just moved back to town less than six months ago after spending many, many years in Washington, D.C. Um, when I was practicing law in D.C., um, I, my firm represented a lot of media companies, um, newspapers, primarily cable companies, TV stations, content owners, things like that. And, um, you know, I focus my work mainly on, on copyright and trademark issues and, you know, counseling on those issues generally and also sort of <coughs> drilling down into the day-to-day -day application of those <coughs> issues um, for businesses and a lot of that is, is contract drafting and negotiation and that, that was sort of my bread and butter. And what I thought I'd talk about today <coughs> are copyright and trademark broadly just to give a little bit of background on those areas. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the application you know, how, how those issues come up when you use social media, things to think about when you're entering into contracts, either as a content owner or somebody who's licensing content from somebody else, um, and a few other issues that are applicable to, you know, technology <coughs> media companies. If you have any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to, to interrupt me and ask away, and I'll save some time for questions at the end. And um, just to start, I'm going to cover copyright find that sometimes copyright and trademark in particular, you know, people tend to confuse them in their minds sometimes. Lately with, you know, digital technology being so pervasive, you know, people are much more aware of these issues than they were um, a while ago. But just to give general background on copyright, co copyright covers original works of authorship. So <coughs> books, films, TV shows, things like that. And, you know, it breaks down into some of the categories listed here. Um, like I said, books, articles, plays, dramatic works, music, which you can divide into two categories, sound recordings, um, and then the underlying composition. So there, there are two separate rights in there. If you write a song, you have rights. If you record a song, you have rights, even if you didn't write it. Um, software is covered by copyright. That intersects with patent a little bit, but in my experience, um, software licensing mostly involves copyrights. Visual art, paintings, sculptures, things like that. Um, and photographs, and you know, sometimes people are surprised to <coughs> to learn that, that photographs, the copyright in a photograph is owned by the person who takes the snapshot. And so if you hire a photographer to come to your wedding and take the pictures, unless you make other arrangements, the photographer is going to own that, and essentially you're going to buy some prints, or maybe you'll get a license, or maybe if you work it out in advance, you know, he or she will transfer the copyright to you, but um, you know, that's one way people encounter this in their personal lives, and all of a sudden you say, oh, I paid a few thousand bucks for a photographer to come to my wedding, and I don't even know the shots. So, <clears throat> what's not copyrightable? Facts and ideas. You know, one of the oldest cases in copyright law has to do with whether or not you can claim copyright protection in the phone book. And an alphabetical list of names and phone numbers, you cannot protect under copyright. Uh, it's called the sweat of the brow doctrine, meaning sweat equity. Even if you put a lot of hard work into compiling some facts, that doesn't give you copyright protection. There are other ways to protect that kind of work. You know, there's some protection for databases. You can protect under copyright, you know, the way you've compiled it, but the underlying facts are always going to be sort of free and open to the public. And so, similar to that, you can't copyright ideas either. You know, ideas are more abstract than the actual expression of those ideas, and so, you know, an example of, of that would be, you know, think about the play Romeo and Juliet. It's an old story, two star-crossed lovers, you know, they come from families that don't get along, there's conflict, there's tragedy at the end. You know, that existed before Shakespeare, that particular idea, that particular story, and it's been replayed in culture many times since. I mean, think about West Side Story, it's the, it's the same thing. and. <clears throat> the interesting thing is you cannot protect the, like, the framework of that story. The idea of two star-crossed lovers is not something that anybody can control. It's, it's the application of it. It's the expression. And so, you know, West Side Story, you know, that setting, those characters, you know, the songs, obviously, you know, that, that starts to be what you can protect. And sometimes there's a little bit of a fuzzy line, but, you know, a lot of folks, you know, may not make the connection that a, a broad idea is not something you can generally protect. So the basic rights of copyright. You can copy or reproduce a work. You can distribute it. Public performance, you know, of a, of a song or a, 
or play or musical, public display of a visual work, or to create derivative works, meaning you know, for if there's an existing work out there and you want to adapt it or refine it or do something new with the underlying <coughs> material, that's an exclusive right of the owner. And so the copyright owner has the exclusive right to do these things, and nobody else can do this with copyrighted work. Nobody can make a copy of a, of a sound recording without permission. You can't sell it or other distribute it for free without permission. You know, if you play it on the radio, you know, the, the radio stations are obligated to make payment to the composer. Public display doesn't really apply to music. Create derivative works. You know, you sample a song and put it in another song. That's, that's a derivative work, and, you know, it's been controversial over the years, but that's a right that the original copyright owner has, and you can't, uh, you can't do it without permission. So there's a movie, you know, Harry Potter 1, you can't make Harry Potter 2 unless you get permission from the, from the author or the filmmaker of Harry Potter 2. And so a lot of the misconceptions about copyright come with how are copyright rights <coughs> Form. When do you when do you get protection in, in a work that you create? And the the word you use in copyright law is fixation. They say you get copyright rights when you fix a work in a tangible medium. And basically, what that means is, if you're writing an article, it's when you put pen to paper and write it down. If you're writing a song, it's when you make a recording. Um, or you can write the lyrics down and put the chord symbols over it, or or you know write music notation. Um, but basically, you have to make it somehow tangible. If it's software, it's when you write your code. If it's in your head, it's not fixed, and you don't get protection. But the moment you put it down, you have copyright rights. Now, there's also the Copyright Office, part of the Library of Congress in DC, and you can register your copyrights there. Um, but again, you don't have to do that to get protection, but there are a lot of reasons why registration is important. So if you're out there making content and you're trying to decide whether you want to register, it's a pretty simple process and um, it's a good idea to do so. Um, for one, if you want to sue in federal court, if somebody's infringing your copyrights, you need to have it registered. And second, if you register it early enough, you know, within about three months after you create it or publish it, um, you don't have to prove your damages in court. So. You know, if you write a song, you don't register it, somebody else starts playing it somewhere. If you, sorry, question? Can, can you register online? Um, you can, there, it, it depends on the type of work. Sometimes you can just upload it. Sometimes if it's a magazine or something like that that you're trying to register, you might need to send a hard copy to the office, but you, for all the registrations, you can at least do part of it online. And it's a, it's a small fee. Uh, 40 or $50 dollars, um, per form. And so, you know, like I was saying, one of the benefits is, is the damages you can get. If, if you don't have it registered, you have to prove to the court that you, know, you suffered this amount of loss. But if you register it, you can collect thousands of dollars without really having to prove anything. And so, if you've ever followed in the news any of these um, file sharing lawsuits where the record companies are suing these people for file sharing and they get these million dollar verdicts, the way they do it is that all those songs have been registered and if you can prove that somebody has willfully infringed, that they knew that it was protected and they did it anyway, you can get up to $150,000 per infringement and that can add up in a hurry. And conversely, if, if somebody doesn't know that something's protected, they do it you know, sort of accidentally or innocently, it can be as low as $200 per infringement. So there's a lot in the court's discretion, but if you own content and you want to protect it, this is the hammer. This is what is the real incentive for people not to infringe, is that you can extract those kind of damages. Um, uh, another important thing to know is the, the length of copyright protection. It's limited in time. And the current rule is that when you create it, you have copyright rights for your entire life plus 70 years after that, meaning you know, your heirs or whoever owns the, the rights after you die will get 70 years of additional protection. Now, if it's a company that creates something, you know, and if employees for your company create it, you know, the sort of default rule there is that the company owns it. Uh, it's a flat 95 years from the time you publish it or you make it available to the public, or it's 120 years from the time you create it, whichever shorter. Now, if you go back in time, it wasn't always this long, and 
Congress has extended the time period over the years, um, you know, specifically because there's some very big and powerful companies that stand to lose a lot of um, <coughs> revenue if people can all of a sudden say, you know, distribute the oldest Mickey Mouse cartoons without having to pay for it. And so it's probably going to be extended even further if, if Disney has anything to say about it. But, you know, if you go back in time, some of the durations are shorter, but if you create something now, it's, it's for that long. Now, I mentioned the, the rights that a copyright owner has. They're also, you know, they're, they're not completely absolute. You can take somebody else's work and do something with it within a very narrow window. And there's a, there's a defense of copyright infringement that's called fair use, and you may have heard about it. And, you know, that the law of fair use dictates how much of a work you can take and what you can do with it. And it's, it's what, you know, it's, it's very bound up with, with freedom of speech. Essentially, you know, the, you can't stop somebody from criticizing your work. You can't stop somebody from making a parody or a commentary on something like that. And it's it's a really complicated area of the law, and it really has to be evaluated on a case by case basis. You know, I can't sort of sit here and tell you this would be okay and this wouldn't be okay because it, it depends on a lot of facts and circumstances. But basically. If there's something that's uh, protected by copyright and, and you want to incorporate it into something that you're doing, you know, you have to think about your use. What are you using it for? Are you really just trying to reproduce it to make some more money off of somebody else's work? Well, that's probably not going to look too good in the, uh, in the eyes of the court. Um, what kind of work are you using? Is it a creative work or is it something that's a little bit closer to, to facts like a news report? You know, the, the less creativity involved, the um, the more likely you are to be able to use a little bit of it without infringing. How much of the work are you taking? Are you taking a little snippet of it? Are you taking the entire work and basically sort of putting a new cover on it and trying to sell it and say, well, it's fair use? Well, I mean, that's probably not going to apply. And then, you know, what's the market out there for what you're doing? Is it something that the copyright owner would reasonably be expected to do him or herself? Because if that's the case and you're invading a market that's available to the copyright owner, you know, you're probably not going to be able to claim this defense. And so again, you know, there's some favored uses that, that <coughs> fair use would allow you to defend against an infringement claim. It's for things like criticism, academia, reporting, anything that sort of transforms the original intended use into something new. And so that, that's a very basic overview of copyright law. Copyright can get really complex. Um, I'm going to move on to trademark, but if anybody has any general questions about copyright, I'd be happy to answer them now. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions. One is when you are quoting somebody else's work mm -hmm. and you're giving them credit in your quote, is, oh. that, is that kosher or is that um, taboo? And if you can do it, how much can you quote before you actually step on their copyright? Um, a good rule of thumb, and it depends on you know what the purpose is of a quotation. You know, if you're writing a book review, you know you're going to be allowed to quote some passages to a certain extent, so you can make your point. It's, it sort of falls under criticism. A good rule of thumb in that situation is take only what you need to make your point. Don't gratuitously quote pages and pages and pages. If you want to capture one descriptive passage of a, of a book that really highlights the your broad criticism or your broad review of the book, you know, do that, but take only what you need because if you start to take more and more, then a court will look at it and say, you know, you're taking more than you need. This really isn't a fair use. It's sort of gratuitous. Uh, well, could you just mention, because I know about it, but uh, the Creative Commons licensing? Uh, um, sure. Cre would, help, would help answer somebody's question, how could I use this? What if you want to tell you that? Well, the Creative Commons licensing has a lot to do with <coughs> this movement, and it, it has probably its real origins in open source software, but <coughs> if a copyright owner wants to share the work broadly, allow people to use it, to use it to develop new ideas, want to place less restrictions on using the work than sort of something that's typically protected by copyright, there are some licenses out there. Um, that you can attach to a work that you put out on the internet that sort of gives the guidelines for people to, to use it. And there's a sort of share and share alike license where, for example, you know, you can use this photograph, but anything, any work that you put it in, you know, any 
any use you make of it, you have to confer the same rights to somebody down the road. And you know, it's it's really a way to to use copyright. It's an interesting innovation. It's a way to use copyright to sort of force people to to share and to encourage innovation by not limiting people, but sort of passing it forward. Um, and, and there are all sorts of ways you can you can do it. You see this on the photo sharing websites a lot, where you know Flickr people can can use these Creative Commons categories to uh, to dictate how they would like people to use it. So you can use this photo anywhere as long as you give me credit. Or you can use this photo for any purpose as long as it's not commercial. You can't sell it to somebody else. And so that's a Creative Commons license. It can be really useful. Yes, ma'am? You had mentioned um, photography, but what about original works of art? If you own it, if you own it, can you take a, an, an image and put it on a cover of a, you know, of a book or something like that? If you so if you own a painting, you know, what can you do with the painting itself? The, <clears throat> you know, that's it's an interesting question because just because you own the painting, even if you own the Mona Lisa, you don't own, and maybe that's a bad example because it was painted so long ago that it's out of copyright. So let's take something a little more new. <laughs> let's take something by Andy Warhol in copyright. If you own an original Andy Warhol, if you own the Maryland's, that doesn't mean you necessarily own a copyright. You can sell a copy of something without giving away your rights. But what you can do with that is you can display it. If you own it, you can have people over at your house and have them look at it. But you know what you what you can't do is exploit any of the rights that the copyright owner would, would have so and want to exploit. You can't give them credits. You can't use it. You can't use it for commercial purposes like that. No, you couldn't put it on the cover of a book without permission. <coughs> But if you own a copy of it, you can hang it up in your house, you can show it to people, you can invite 50 people over to your house and have them see it. That's, that goes back to the public display right. If you own a copy, you can display it, but you can't distribute it. Can I take it one step further? Sure. If you hire that artist to do a cover for mm -hmm. you, and you have the original art, is that yours then? If you pay them for that specific <clears throat> It depends on the arrangement you strike with the artist. The default position in that situation, if that person isn't your full-time employee, then if you pay him to create something for you, he is going to own the copyright rights unless you set it down in writing that he's assigning them for you. It's called work made for hire. And you know that's one of the most important issues you get into with, um, with contracts for creative services. And I'll get to this a little later, but who, who owns the material after you do it? If you have a graphic design firm, you know, <clears throat> come up with some designs that you're going to use to promote your business. Do they own it when you're done, or do you own it? And if you're the client and you get get it in writing that they're transferring all the rights to you, then even the designer who did it in the first place can't go back and use it again because they've given up that right. I have kind of an idea that goes, or a question that goes along with that. If you have an idea for a company, mm -hmm. and how far, I guess, does the idea have to be fleshed out for you to be able to copyright it to be able to get something for that? Like, no. is it, you have to have, is, like, if you can't actually produce it, but you have, like, packaging, everything, how far, I guess, would you have to go to be, like, do you have to create a prototype, or can you have? Well, I mean, it depends on the type of company, and it depends on, really, what you're doing. I mean, if, you, if you're if you wanting to sell products, if you've invented something, mm -hmm. that's, that's patent law. Okay. And, you know, you need to be able to make the product work and you need to get a patent attorney to help you file a patent with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. If you're just trying to start a business and you have an idea for the, you know, for the next great service that you're going to provide on the web, just that abstract idea you're not going to be able to protect. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to write a software program to make that happen, then the particular software you write to achieve that end, that's what you're going to be able to protect the copyright. Yes, sir. Does the, um, the copyright have to be clearly labeled, like the little copyright logo or something for the general public to know it's copyrighted? <clears throat> Notification is, it's not fatal if it's not on there, but it's, you will see most sort of organized media companies will have a copyright notice. Um, it helps avoid people saying, well, gee, I didn't know this was subject to any copyright protection. You know, technically you're supposed to have it, you know, copyright, author's name, year, um, it's not fatal if it's not on there, but it's encouraged, and you know it's it's changed over the years. It used to be absolutely necessary, you know, a hundred years ago. You know, if you didn't put the notice on there, you, you lost your rights. That's not the case now, but it's it's encouraged. Right. 
Ben, how does Huffington Post get away with pulling stories from all over the world? <clears throat> you know, I mean, that part of that is a function of how the internet works and, you know, when you link to somebody else's page, basically the way it's shaken out is that there's an implied license to link to any content that's okay. sort of on the web. But what Huffington Post will do is quote a lot. You know, maybe they'll take big chunks of the article and, you know, they're, they're really skirting the line of fair mm -hmm. use. And, you know, they, they may throw a quote in there and a little bit of, you know, intro and then say, click here for more. And so long as they don't take too much, so long as they don't, you know, totally swallow the need to, to actually click through to the other site, then they're probably okay. But there, there have been some scandals lately, and this, you know, sometimes this falls a little bit more on the lines of plagiarism than copyright, where, you, you know, there are news stories out there, you're not giving credit to, to who broke the story or who did the reporting. So it's a little bit of a combination of the two, but it's, it's interesting, some journalists, and, you know, especially the Huffington Post as a whole, comes under some fire for not really doing reporting, they're just aggregating, and the question is how much content do you actually put up there? Um, you may address this later, but I'll ask it if you want to defer it to later. Um, when you respond to an RFP, mm -hmm. especially a creative RFP where you're giving a strategy, including um, you know potential layout, um, potential content, you know what avenues to take the client in to you know to move a brand forward, um, and you copyright that information. Um, how do you protect that? Because people pull threads of it constantly and um, are implementing it. And of course, you, you, I've never sued anybody for it. I don't know that I stand on ground to do it. But it's pretty frustrating whenever you're not getting paid to produce the RFP, but you're using your talent, which mm -hmm. is creativity and strategy. And people just treat it like it's their own. Where, where does the law come in? Um, well, I suppose it depends on what exactly they take from the materials you submit. I mean, anything that is subject to copyright protection that you <coughs> have somebody to look at in an RFP to decide if they want to hire you to flesh it out further, they're not allowed to just take that and run with it. I mean, you know, you might want to look at the at the RFP and make sure there are no terms in there that say, you know, by, by responding to this, you give us a license to use any of the materials you submit. I mean, that's you know, that's one pitfall, and that's one reason to always read the fine print. But, you know, if it's just an RFP and, you know, submit your materials and we'll decide if we want to hire you, and then if they take something that you've done and start using it, I mean, that's an infringement. It depends on exactly what it is. I mean, if they're taking some specific designs that you've created and they start to use it without crediting you, then, or not even without crediting you, without getting your permission and paying you if you require it, that's an infringement. If it's just sort of a strategy, then that's going to be a little bit harder to protect. Copyright doesn't protect sort of like a a media strategy, but it can protect content you create to further that strategy, press materials, things that you write, authorship, you know, that's what it protects and, you know, it's just copyright infringement at that point. That's Should she put a copyright on it or what would be a good sentence for her to put on there? Well, I think that, you know, when you're submitting the RFP and you put a copyright notice on it, say, all rights reserved, you know, until we enter into a binding contract for the use of this material, you know, this is for your, this is for your internal review only. But if you're required to present it, like in, the, in this forum, mm -hmm. if you're required to present an RFP, so everybody in the room is hearing what your presentation is, even though your work is copyrighted, even though it's copyrighted on screen, mm -hmm. certainly anybody that's got a hard copy of it sees that it's copyrighted. And then those um, creative ideas, uh, honestly, it's happened nationally, not just locally. It's not just my, my whining here. It's not just about, you know, Susie stole, you know, my idea. Um, it's, it's happened nationally. Um, and, of course, it costs money to pursue infringement. So it does. And so as a practical matter, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to keep people from doing that. It, it does get back a little bit to the concept that you can't really copyright an idea. You know, broad strategy, you're not going to be able to protect. And unfortunately, you know, cat's out of the bag, somebody else may run with it. It's the implementation of that strategy. It's, it's the expression, as, as they call it under the law, that, that is protected. And so if it's just, you know, go after this market and somebody takes it without I mean, using your services on how to do that, you know, you're, you're not going to have much of a remedy in that case, unfortunately. Okay. Um, 
So the next broad area is, is trademark law. And trademark covers words or devices used to identify goods and services and their source of origin. And so it's basically your brand. It has its roots in consumer protection. You know, the, the real idea behind trademark law, although not necessarily in practice these days, is to make sure that consumers don't get confused when they're looking at two different brands out there. And so that's why you can acquire trademark rights in a particular word or symbol or logo and keep somebody else from using it. How expensive is that? To, to register a trademark? Mm -hmm. Well, like copyright, you don't have to register a trademark to get trademark rights. Trademark rights are developed through use. So once you start using it on your product or to brand your services, you acquire rights automatically. Um, until you actually use it in commerce, though, you don't start acquiring those rights. Now, there is a way to file with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for what's called an intent to use. If you have the idea for the brand that's going to be this business and you're not ready to launch the business yet, you want to make sure nobody else comes into that space with that name because you think it's the greatest thing. You can file an application, you pay some fees, you can sort of keep your rights to that for up to three years. What you don't have are trademark rights. You don't have trademark rights yet, but you can keep somebody else from you know, starting to use it. And so long as you pay the fees and make the filings for up to three years, you can keep that on file with the trademark office. But if you don't use it by then, you lose your rights. Yes, ma'am? It's my understanding that's all you have to do, and then later on, because you're now publicly listed in federal paperworks, I received solicitations from international firms. Let us register you internationally. Here, pay this fee for five ninety five, and you will be covered. Mm -hmm. My guess is all of those are, maybe there's some legitimacy in there, but I doubt it. You know, they're fishing. Uh, but can you tell me more about those um, Well, once you register a trademark in the U.S., uh, a lot, what a lot of foreign trademark practitioners will do is go through and, and find the contact information for the people who own the trademark registration and market their international services to you. And, you know, every country has a trademark registry, and if you want to do business in, in other countries and use that brand, it is a good idea to register it over there. Um, now, unless you're using it, I, I don't see how somebody could sort of say, I'm going to get you a worldwide trademark registration if you just pay me this fee. You're going to have to demonstrate that you're using it, or you know, you're supposed to be able to demonstrate that you're using it. Not all, not all countries require a proof of use. The U.S. will require you to submit a, a sample, it's called a specimen, to show that you're actually using the mark before you can get a registration. Um, in China, for example, you don't have to actually submit that specimen, but if somebody challenges your trademark, if you can't prove that you've been using it, you will lose the registration. And so trademark registrations in foreign countries are important, but only if you're doing business over there. And you can't really get the rights until you until you start using it over there. Yes? I uh, had a, a college capstone project a few years ago. And uh, my professor said that you know, I get to keep the IP and the, mm -hmm. the copyright, all the information. He didn't even want to code the project because he thought it was a really good idea. And he I had some group members, and um, you know, I, I pitched to them the idea. We mm -hmm. have a name for the idea, which I intended to use a little bit later on. And the following day, I was going to register a domain in that name. But one of my group members decided that he was going to be able to punch, and he registered the domain. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion with him. I said, well, you know, in order for me to take this business further, I'm going to actually have to have ownership of, of this domain name. Um, you know, it's been about two years now, and I was I was trying to be, you know, diplomatic mm -hmm. and wait for the registration to expire, and then buy the registration, but he, he re-upped the, the registration. So I called him uh, not too long ago, and I, I asked him about it. And, you know, in so many words, he said, no, I'm not going to transfer the domain name to you. If you want the domain, you'll have to include me in the IP. Um, so, in other words, he's cyber squatting. Now, the, the name of the domain is actually the trademark of mm -hmm. what I intend to use this project for. So if I were to, to do this trademark, would I have any particular recourse in, in that action? It sounds like in your particular case, you might be out of luck. <laughs> yeah, because if, you, if you've developed your trademark rights and then somebody registers a domain name and squats on it, 
you have recourse against that person. But if you haven't acquired any trademark rights yet, if you haven't started using that mark in commerce in association with your with your product or your services out with the public, if you haven't done that yet and he's registered the domain name, then you know the, the law that has been developed to allow people to 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 get domain names from cyber squatters wouldn't really apply to you, unfortunately. I mean, it sounds a little bit like extortion, but she's like, yeah, what he's doing exactly. to you, but I don't, I don't yeah. think you have a remedy under, you know, the, the anti-cyber squatting act, unfortunately, but, you know, I think it really is fact dependent, you know, the whole circumstances could paint a slightly different picture. I think what I'll do is just uh, invite him into the idea of writing contracts, having signed the contract, and in that contract, uh, sign it, you know, the domain rights will be signed. Yeah, I mean, if he's going to be part of the business, then yeah, the business itself needs to own the domain name. Right. Yes, ma'am. Well, wouldn't that specifically be covered by the ICANN regulations that if, some, that if you're using a domain name to intentionally drive business away from another business, that he could file under ICANN? I mean, the the UDRP action under ICANN is a way to, to get a domain name from somebody else, but, and, you know, I've been a part of several of those. Unless you can establish that you had the rights in the mark before the person registered the domain name, then I, I think you're out of luck. And unfortunately, you had the idea for the trademark and to use it with your company, but you hadn't yet Not put it out there. You know, I mean, and you don't even have to have it registered, although that helps. You know, if you have com what's called common law rights, if you've just been using it and developing your rights that way without registration, you might still have a remedy. Well, in that case, uh, I did because in the in the drafting of this whole project, mm -hmm. you know, the name of the company was was agreed upon, and that's what we were going to use. And then the registration of the domain. Right. The drafting, internal use, and not use out with the public might not be enough to to have trademark rights. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to the international markets. Real practical question. We're um, launching iPhone, iPad, and mobile apps mm -hmm. in the store. Well, I mean, businesses that, that sell their products or services throughout the world often will try to secure trademark registrations in many of the countries, or at least in the countries they think are going to be most strategically important for them. Um, in Europe, it's a little easier because the, you know, the EU has what they call a community trademark where you can register a mark through that system and you get rights in all the countries um, that, that participate. But if you want rights in South America, you're going to have to go to each country. If you want rights in China and Japan, you're going to have to go to each of those countries um, individually. And you know, a lot of countries have their own version of common law rights where somebody just can't start using and deceiving consumers by claiming to be you and using your mark. But a trademark registration is, is strong evidence up front that you've got those rights. And so that's why people are going to be doing business in those countries. If you think a lot of downloads are going to come from certain countries and you want to make sure that nobody else is over there trying to, you know, trade on your goodwill, it, it might be worthwhile to, to get the international registration. Yes, sir. There was a, another guy from one of the people who thought about trade trademark in the past, and he said that if you're going to another country, mm -hmm. if you trademark in the U.S., it blocks you from the other countries unless you do it all at the same time. I think it was patents, probably. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's not exactly the case with trademark. There's some treaties that deal with with trademark, and you can get some priority if you register in a foreign country, and then you want to get a trademark registration in the U.S. You can you can build on your registration from a foreign country to help you get and date your trademark registration in, in the U.S. based on the date you, you filed it um, in another country, and, and vice versa a lot of times, but. You know, you're not blocked out or you don't block other people out. You know, if you register in the U.S., that doesn't block people in other countries. Trademark trademark rights can be very geographic, even within the U.S. If you have a business in Savannah, you have a trademark, and you develop a lot of goodwill in Savannah, and at the same time somebody's doing the same thing in California, you know, if neither of you has a national registration, if neither of you is, is doing business nationally, you can develop some rights that you can protect locally, but you couldn't protect on the other side of the country. 
As a business owner, and all of us are on Facebook, what are the things we really need to be aware of legally? Well, um, I have an example coming up here, and so let me, let's just flip ahead to some social media. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of the pitfalls of social media aren't necessarily legal pitfalls. It's it's PR, it's putting statements out there that you know maybe upon reconsideration you, you maybe maybe you shouldn't have. You know there was a pretty famous example recently of, of a PR firm for I think one of the big three auto manufacturers in Detroit was um, managing the official I think it was the official Twitter feed of let's say Ford. It might have been GM. I can't remember. And you know, one of the employees who's responsible for doing that thought he was logged out of the Ford feed and into his personal Twitter feed and posted some slightly off-color message. It wasn't anything horribly embarrassing, but it's not exactly what you know, a giant corporation wants to put out there to all of America. And you know, Ford was angry. They fired the PR firm who fired the employee who did that. And so that's, you know, that's sort of a common sense pitfall. The legal pitfalls are a little bit different. And, you know, the, the short answer is that the same laws will apply. Copyright and trademark laws apply on social media platforms. But something to think about in Facebook is when you use it, what rights are you granting Facebook, the company, to the content you put on the site? And so if you read the terms, any content that you put on Facebook's site, you grant them a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use any IP content post on or in connection with Facebook. That is an extremely broad grant of rights. Now, to back it up a little bit, you need to grant Facebook some kind of license in order for it to display it on all the, you know, all the Facebook pages where it might happen to go. And that's what you intend to do. You put a photo up there, you want your friend, your Facebook friend across the country to be able to pull it up on their screen. And technically that's making a copy or a distribution and they need the they need a license to do that. But this goes well beyond that. And so, if you're a professional photographer and you want to promote your business, do you really want to give away your lifeblood by posting all your images on Facebook to have them, to have Facebook use it for whatever they want to? I mean, that grant of rights is so broad that Facebook could, could um, use the images in ads if it wanted to for, for the service. It could, it says it's sub-licensable, which means that Facebook can now license anybody else that it wants to to use the image for whatever purposes they want. I mean, there are no restrictions on this at all. And, you know, practically you don't see a lot of that. There would be a giant uproar if it started happening. And, you know, from a Facebook steps in it every now and then, as we all know. You know, they change their privacy terms or something and there's an uproar and they pull it back. But as a practical matter, as a photographer, you don't want to, you don't want to put your images up like that. So I've advised people Link it to a Flickr page where you can control what you do and what people can do with those licenses. You can use the Creative Commons licenses to sort of fine tune your control. Yes, sir. I think you might have just addressed it. When it says post on Facebook or in connection with, would a link to a Flickr page, would that help um, solve uh, some, of the, some of the copyright problems? Like if I link to another page, that's in connection with Facebook. Well, I mean, they can't really come into my domain, I guess. The words in connection with are, I'm sure, very deliberate on Facebook's part because they want to be able to argue that they have as broad a grant of rights as possible. You know, I, I think most people would agree that that probably doesn't extend to a link to a third site. So you posting something on Flickr and then posting a link from Facebook to the Flickr page, I would say, does not mean that you posted the information on Flickr in connection with Facebook. But you know, they they, they want to be able to make any plausible argument like that, and so I don't. I would be shocked if, if any court would would sort of yeah, give it that broader. With a preview does show up. They've got. That. I think they have a claim on that preview. You can select show no preview. Yeah, they, okay. there, there, there's, there's also a whole area of copyright law that has developed around thumbnail images. And, you know, a lot of times that's a fair use, but that's not going to be probably, I would argue, it's not subject to this kind of 
you know, to this broad license that you get from <coughs> Facebook. It's a fair use to show a little preview because it's not the real work. It's just, you know, it's, it's just a preview. Great area of the law. <laughs> yes. Uh, aside from Facebook, mm -hmm. any website that um, so, uh, receives user contributed content, all they have to do then is put a um, disclaimer like that and anything you upload becomes the property of that website? Essentially, yes. I mean, if you read the terms of service and, you know, I, we, we may have time to get to, to website terms of service and privacy policies, but, you know, for, for websites where there are active discussion forums, a lot of times you will see in the terms of service that the user, you know, by using the website, you're agreeing to these terms, and these terms say anything you put up here, we, you know, we now own. You give us. It's usually not an assignment of the rights. It's a license to do whatever they want with it. And most of the time, you know, the site wants it so that they can edit the comments if there, you know, if there's language they don't agree with, and they can delete it. But you know, they may also want to pull out <coughs> comments on an article and highlight it in in some promotions and. And you know that that's a valuable tool for a media website, and the terms of service will sort of dictate what you can and can't do. And those kind of things are enforceable. And you know, one of the points I'll I'll get to in a minute, maybe if we have time, is if you're launching a website, you know, what should you do with terms of service? What should you do with privacy policies? You know, to make them enforceable, where do you need to put them? And you know, the answer from my perspective is try and make it reasonably prominent enough on every single page. You don't want a user to have any plausible argument that they couldn't find it. You don't want to bury it on an About Us page somewhere. Put it front and center, you know, you see them at the bottom. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, I just wanted to go back, <coughs> I just wanted to go back to the trademark. Mm -hmm. thing for a second. So, in my case, since I wanted to start my own animation company, I have all these stories lined up. If I trademark the actual company name, would that cover the individual stories, you would have to like trademark each one of those too. Um, in, in terms of the title of the of the, like the title or the logo, or you get into an intersection of trademark and copyright law right there, and so you probably want to trademark the name of your business. And you know, if you haven't launched it yet, and you've got a name that you want to make sure nobody else gets it before you, you might file the intent to use application that we discussed before. For the individual stories, you know, when you create them, you're going to get your copyright rights, okay. um, and that'll, you know, prevent people from copying the actual animations themselves. Okay. If you have a title for it, that's not really subject to trademark unless you really develop some goodwill. So, you know, when Star Wars the movie came out, you know, George Lucas didn't have trademark rights in the title Star Wars right away. But Star Wars has become so famous, it's gone so far beyond the movies, it, it you know, has such an immediate identification with so many things that he's developed trademark rights in that title. But the general rule of thumb is initially titles, you know, don't get trademark rights without some further use. Okay. Um, email accounts don't come to the social media, I guess. So if you send any pictures by email, no one else except the uh, yeah, if you just if you just email a photo that, that you own the rights to, I mean you're you know you're essentially yeah. distributing it to the person who receives it. Yeah. Um, you're not giving them any rights to do anything else with it except for have that copy on the on their computer. As a practical matter, you know if you don't want people sharing anything, don't email it. I mean you you have some rights. If you email it to a friend, you know if you took this photograph that you know you want to mount and sell and you want to sell you know, as a fine art print and you start emailing it around, you could stop people from making those prints. Um, you could stop, you know, it being used as a stock image if it starts to happen, but you know, the horse is kind of out of the barn. So it's it's a it's a balance between the practicality of, of going after infringers and you know wanting to use something like email to share it. But you're not giving you're not sort of implying any sort of license just by emailing it to somebody. All you're doing is giving that person a copy and he doesn't have any additional rights except to keep that copy you gave him. <clears throat> a little bit more about social media. Um, this isn't as much about copyright or trademark, but uh, it's an important thing to think about if you're a media company. Um, the Federal Trade Commission has very broad authority to, to regulate trade and commerce, and 
fairly recently they've they've issued some guidelines on on the behaviors that um, bloggers <coughs> can exhibit in terms of um, reviewing products and whether they get compensation for that. So basically, the rule is if you're a blogger, you know, if you have a video game blog and you know you review new games that come out and you create a little bit of a following and people like your opinions and trust your judgment. Well, if you get a free copy of that game, you have to disclose it. If somebody pays you to do a review, you have to disclose it, or you're gonna you're gonna face fines. And you know that that's it's a consumer protection issue. It's making sure that people know that you know this isn't a completely objective opinion that that there is some material connection between the, the blogger and the and the company that, that made the game. And the same applies maybe to favorable mentions on Twitter or other platforms. If you go around tweeting about some product you really like, you know, if there are celebrities out there that are, you know, mentioning a brand that they like, they have to disclose that they're getting some compensation. You know, it's because the idea is that, you know, in a TV commercial, everybody assumes that if a celebrity appears, he's getting paid. But in a platform like Twitter, it's not so obvious. So if somebody just said, you know, wow, I just bought a new pair of Nikes and they're great, you wouldn't automatically assume by reading that that you know somebody got a free pair of Nikes or somebody was paid to wear Nikes. Yes, sir. You know, I read that Kim Kardashian gets ten thousand dollars every two semesters. And yeah, I mean, you can see why it's it's such a valuable property and why you know the Federal Trade Commission is interested in that. And if you don't disclose, you can get fined up to eleven thousand dollars per. Uh, so, if you're doing, <clears throat> pardon me, if you're doing it on a blog, is it a uh, does it have to be like in a particular article about the game you're writing about, or can it be on your website on a page at the very end that they won't even see unless they go to the bottom to click to it that says like I get you know stuff from this, 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 and this company? My That's advice would be not to bury it like that yeah. because you're sort of inviting trouble. I, you know, you don't have to make it the headline review of the free game I got, or yeah. you know, you know, I get paid to review this game, you know, next up on my blog. But you need to find a way to disclose it so the reader is, is likely to see it. You can put it at the end, at the very end of the article, the last sentence can be full disclosure, colon, I received, you know, this game was given to me for free. It doesn't, you know, like it doesn't have to be the banner, but, you know, don't, don't try to hide it because yeah. that will get you in trouble. Just a comment on that, I review baby products for Draco, and they, with each product I get, I get a sheet that tells me to the specific wording I have to put on my blog page that says that I have received this item for free and it's, it's written by Graco's legal team, so it's in compliance with, with this. And yeah, that's the flip side to this, and it's a very good point. If you are trying to generate publicity for your company, you know, you're also open to liability if you're paying people to review things and, and it's not being disclosed. So the, the, you know, the, the, the same thing is true on the other side. Would the same thing apply if she was working for, if she was writing for parent, parents of the magazine? Yeah, I mean, even in magazines, they, they tell you, you'll, you'll see that they've got, there's something to mention in there that they get products with free, they, they get everybody. Generally, how you can also get on the free with that is that you give the product away, so you only took it in for a review process. You're not looking at it yourself, so it's not actually a conversation. You're really just reviewing the product and then sending it out, which is one of the ways that I was explaining to uh, the great guy. And that's correct. Is, is if you don't keep the product, then generally it's not a material connection because you're not getting any value out of it. You know, a book reviewer for a newspaper doesn't have to disclose that you know he got the book for free because basically the book was given to the newspaper and it's not owned by the individual. So that person's views aren't being swayed by the fact that they got something for free. And you can extrapolate that to other products. You know, if somebody's reviewing the new iPhone, Apple probably provides a free review phone, but that person is not going to get to keep it. If they did, they'd absolutely have to disclose it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always had the same. I've always, when I worked with products, they were always so expensive that I sent a return box mm -hmm. for the <laughs> for the reviewer to send it back to me. But for instance, um, it, I know that when the Palm came out, they, they sent free Palms uh, uh, to. I mean, this is years ago, but they sent them to all the analysts in, in town. You know, I mean, across the country, what kind of, I mean, how can they regulate this on, on the internet and not on, in other media? 
Well, I mean, these rules came about pretty recently you know, in reaction to, to these types of social media platforms. And, you know, it, in the offline world, it, it kind of depends on, on how it happens and, and whether it involves advertising. I mean, Palm, is, Palm can give these things away to whoever they want to. Right. Um, you know, if you're, when, you, when everybody can be a blogger is when things get a little, get a little tricky before it was just people who had you know real media platforms from which to speak whereas you know disclosure might become an issue but if you're just giving it to a bunch of top businessmen and hoping to you know generate some buzz you know that kind of offline buzz I don't think there is really any disclosure requirement but now everybody can have a blog anybody can have a platform you know the the line starts to blur a little bit and that's when the NBC <coughs> got interested and, and decided that you know they needed to set some guidelines yes ma'am I mean, isn't this going to become really almost unmanageable in a site like Yelp and, and others and Amazon, power reviewers and so forth? I mean, in some language, maybe some of the people have received product or compensation, but not everybody. And, I mean, how's the FTC ever going to lose this? Well, I mean, it's going to be difficult. And the FTC, when they, when they do things like this, they tend to go for the big targets. Um, and you know they've even said as much. They say this is about keeping big corporations in line. We're not going after a kid with a law necessarily. That doesn't mean they couldn't or they wouldn't, depending on the circumstances. But I mean, Yelp is interesting because that gets to the sort of the last bullet point here a little bit. Is that if you're a restaurant owner and you go on Yelp and give yourself positive reviews, that's something that you need to disclose. And you know, for that to attract the FTC's attention, I mean, the FTC has a lot of it to play. And something like that probably wouldn't attract its attention, but if, if Yelp is sort of letting that happen, encouraging it to happen, you know, if it starts to become this sort of feedback loop where restaurant owners just talk themselves up, then the FTC might take interest in the platform itself and, and, you know, see if there's not an angle there for an enforcement action. But in terms of administering it and enforcing it, it's going to be difficult. They're going to pick high profile targets and try and make their point. Well, does the, the does caveat mTOR not apply anymore? I mean, does does fire beware? Not. I mean, is it is the F, F, FTC taking on the responsibility for the individuals? I mean, you know, caveat emptor applies, but there are, you know there have always been laws about truth in advertising, and you know in TV commercials, you know, those kind of disclosures happen, and they you know they become commonplace enough where disclosure isn't required every time a celebrity is you know every time Michael Jordan you know does a Nike commercial. Nobody needs to be told that he's getting paid, but you know, truth in advertising was and is you know still important, and you know that's that doesn't make it to the courts too much. Usually, it's companies suing each other over that, but you know that that's still an issue. And yeah, caveat emptor, except if companies are making false claims about what their products do. Or, <coughs> yeah. um, something like a video game, uh, since it has a lot of content, that's owned by a lot of people, mm -hmm. if somebody was to be playing the video game themselves playing the video game uh, and then they review the game. What, uh, where does that content fall under as far as showing the video of themselves playing the game online? It kind of depends on the purpose of, of making a video. Well, if, just a review. Just a review. I mean, if, if somebody reviewed themselves playing through all 12 levels of the video game and show everything and, and all the secrets and, you know, all the levels and everything like that and all the content and all the Easter eggs and all the whatever, I think you'd have a pretty good case that it's copyright infringement, that they've played the whole thing and it's just up there gratuitously for people to see so they don't have to buy it and look at it all. But if somebody's doing a legitimate review and they're making a point about the gameplay here and you know, you know, this this particular scene is, you know, really illustrative of, you know, the way the game works well or the way the game doesn't work well, and they give a little snippet of, of the gameplay in their review, that's probably going to be covered by fair use. But again, it depends on, on how much they take, you know? They don't want to take, they shouldn't take more than they need to to make their point. Criticism is favored in this, in this instance. Well, uh, as far as the movie industry, how does that work? If somebody just takes a snippet of a movie and puts it online, is that mm -hmm. fair use? I mean, it depends on the purpose that they're doing it. Just to review the movie, or if you're reviewing the movie, if you're making say, a comment like, about the movie, this is a great movie, scene. You know, if you if you just decide you want to start putting snippets of your favorite movies up on your blog, 
that's probably not going to be a fair use. I mean, you're probably not going to get a lot of blowback from the movie industry because they have a lot of other issues they're worrying about right now. But you know, that's probably going to be copyright infringement. If you take a five-minute scene from you know your ten favorite movies, I, I would hesitate to give you a like time frame because it really depends on the really depends on the context. <coughs> Is there a specific time frame though, like on music? Like, um, let's say you have a video and you want to have some background music. Typically, um, whether it's a newspaper or something else who is creating some original video, mm -hmm. would feel you had maybe 30 seconds you could use, or would you have to go find um, specifically uh, music that was not copyrighted and you kind of just use that as background? I would not use any copyrighted music as background at all, videos even like five seconds. That would be an infringement. I don't think that there's but a fair. The time frame doesn't matter. The time frame doesn't matter. You know, that's it's another sort of copyright myth that's out there a little bit. Is if you use less than thirty seconds of something, um, you know, it's fair use. That's that's not the case. Like if you're reviewing an album and you put a thirty second snip of a song up there. You know, that's probably okay because you want to give enough of the song for the listener to understand your points. You know, you couldn't put the whole song up there because that, you know, totally gets rid of any incentive for the person to buy the song. But if you're creating a separate video and you just want something in the background, you know, the, the composer or the performer, you know, should be paid for that. That's, that's a commercial use of, of his or her work. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't think you should do that without securing the rights or getting somebody to write some original music. You mentioned stuff that I didn't expect to be uncovered today, and that's this um, last bullet point here. Mm -hmm. In the hospitality industry, a lot of um, people will comp uh, lodging or comp a restaurant or comp tours or whatever to um, hosting travel writers <laughs> that are, you know, previewing the city or writing about the city. Um, I've run across some writers who say that there are company policies XYZ magazine or XYZ newspaper will not allow them to accept comp, that they must pay even a small, smaller fee um, in lieu of, uh, um, is that where this is going, is that they won't accept the comp so that they won't fall into this FTC ditch? I mean, if they don't want to disclose that they're getting the comp, I mean, some of it, you know, that, that's a little bit of journalism. And, and those kind of ethics in addition to what the FTC is doing. And so, you know, the restaurant critic for the Washington Post pays for all his meals, or the, or the, the newspaper does at least. They don't, you know, they don't want any whiff of impropriety that you know, he's giving us a good review because the chef pulled out all the stops and gave him an expensive bottle of wine and blah, 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 and he didn't pay for it, and therefore he's more inclined to write a favorable review. From a journalism perspective, they don't want that implication. What the FTC is trying to do is, from a consumer's perspective, make sure that consumers aren't misled and that they, you know, you should know if somebody's given this resort a great review, well, you know, did you get to stay there for a week for free? Was everything that you had there comped? Was your airfare paid? And yeah. There, I mean, are, there are companies that do that that will pay your entire expense to come in. What the FTC is saying is that that kind of stuff should be disclosed because it's a material connection between the company and, and the individual who gives the review. Well, I'm having good questions here. I'm sure you only finished half of what you Pretty much, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's unfortunate. Well, that's the way it goes because we promised we should finish. Answer sort of general.